It's July 16th, 2020. This is Rook. What happens when a talented Iranian artist becomes a master of calligraphy and a master of classical instruments? Well, naturally, he mixes them and creates music calligraphy. Renowned visual artist Bahman Panahi joins us from Paris on the passion and performance of his letters on canvas. But first, the latest sad outrage from an Iranian regime that never fails to disappoint. How the simple act of expression is a path to execution for three young men in today's Iran, and how that is potentially galvanizing a new movement to call out this regime. This is Conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 27 of Rook. We have our full team here on hand for our Rook Roundtable. We have Bahman Panahi coming up for a feature interview about how he has come to international acclaim for his intersection of music and calligraphy. He'll join us from France in about an hour. We have our Letters of the Week with Keon, and joining our roundtable is the poet and activist Bahar al Masi. And veteran journalist Mohammed Manzapur will join me in just a few moments. But first, some words. It's time for the atrocities in Iran to end. In the name of all of those of us with Iranian descent, it's time for the atrocities in Iran to end. Today marks the three-month point of our little program. We launched it as an idea and with little fanfare, committed to building it as we go, and we have proudly done so. It's still new and there's lots to do, but one of the precipitants for beginning this program, for wanting to be Rook, was something that I talked about on our very first episode three months ago today, that people of Iranian descent have been through a particularly devastating time in the last year and for the last four decades. And we endeavor to create a space with this show in English, in the diaspora, where ideas, issues, and our connective tissue is explored. Well, today, 13 weeks in, one thing is for sure. The difficult days for Iranians, for our brothers and sisters and family members and friends inside Iran, and all those of us who feel the resonance of what happens there and reverberates through the diaspora, the difficult days continue. It's time for the atrocities in Iran to end. I have committed myself to not editorializing on every edition of Rook. We have committed ourselves to trying to create change and solidarity by exploring our culture, taking a critical look at ourselves at times, and to finding ways that we can achieve unity and common support. But there will be times when it is necessary to not mince words. You may by now have heard the latest outrage emanating from the hands and minds of those in charge of the regime in Iran, the proposition to preside over the execution of three young men for simply speaking out and exercising their desire to expression during the widespread anti-government protests in Iran last year. This latest shame screaming across the headlines of news feeds around the world is a reminder that the country of our heritage is still one of the darkest examples of suppression, repression, and authoritarian behavior anywhere in the world. The idea that the lives of three young people should be taken simply for having an opinion in 2020 is absurd. It's time for these atrocities in Iran to end. It's time for Iranians around the world to truly speak as one voice in support of the people inside Iran and demand accountability from this regime. It's time for the Iranian leadership to know that it can no longer do as it pleases, treating its own citizens as fodder for fear, meeting out injustice through the blood of its own people. 
It's time for these atrocities to end, and there are some signs of hope in the solidarity we are seeing around the globe. In the last few days, there has been an avalanche of collective outrage in social media and in every platform within reach to say, no more. To say these killings must end, millions in an unprecedented fashion are signaling that they will not stand for it anymore, that the days finally of these kinds of actions by this regime are numbered. It's time for the atrocities in Iran to end. I want to bring in our first guest, who is our very own Mohammed Manzarpour, a member of the Rook editorial board and a veteran journalist who is based in Washington, D.C. Mohammed, who is a psychologist by education, started his work in journalism in Tehran as a reporter at the height of the student protests in 1999. He was on the ground in that Tehran University dormitory as it was under siege by the Basij and other paramilitary forces. Mohammed went on to become the economic editor of the English language daily Tehran Times before joining BBC Persian back in 2002. In 2008, he was assigned to Jerusalem as BBC Persian's first Middle East correspondent and covered the 2008 Gaza War from Gaza City. He was also the lead correspondent in covering the Arab Spring across the Middle East and North Africa, reporting from Cairo's Tahrir Square in the deadly days of the Egyptian uprising. Between 2011 and 2017, Mohammed moved to D.C. as Washington bureau chief for the BBC Persian service and later served as the executive editor of VOA Persian. Like many other Iranian journalists, he is a former political prisoner and has been detained and tortured in the notorious Evian prison in Tehran. Right now, Mohammed Manzapour joins me from Washington, D.C. Hello, sir. Hello, Jian. It's, uh, it's definitely an honor to be on the show, and thank you very much for inviting me, despite the fact that it's under uh, very disturbing circumstances with regard to the lives of uh, these three young people facing uh, you know, execution. It is sad. I, I, I would have hoped to have come on at a more cheerful time, but unfortunately, this is the fact. Hopefully, but there'll be lots of opportunities for that. It's, it is nice to have your voice on the program as opposed to just behind the scenes uh, working with us in an editorial capacity and helping us out with uh, your fountain of information. So, uh, Mohammed, let's just start. I mean, we're not really a news program. We're, we we, we want to look at things and talk about them uh, within the diaspora. But uh, for the sake of it, what is the latest with this story? Because it keeps changing. What's the latest as you know it? Well, basically, uh, the hashtag Edom Nakonid, or Don't Execute, uh, became an international trend on Twitter on uh, on Tuesday of this week, with more than 2 million people uh, using the hashtag and uh, reaching far more beyond that number. Some estimate more than 3 billion people have seen the hashtag uh, over the uh, over the past few days. Um, subsequent to that, uh, there was a report by Forest News Agency near to the IRGC, which suggested that uh, the executions have been uh, temporarily halted for further investigation. Uh, but that report was uh, immediately uh, denied by the uh, by the judiciary uh, website, uh, the Mizan uh, news website, which said that there has been no halt in the process of executing these young people, uh, but there could be if their lawyers uh, acted upon it. The interesting fact is that one of the lawyers of these uh, three, uh, Dr. Babake Paknia, um, tweeted that uh, th- uh, they were given access to uh, to the case only on on Wednesday after uh, the sentences were approved by the Iranian uh, Supreme Court. So the so basically the the lawyers had no access to their uh, defendants or to the case documents before the uh, judgment was finalized. Right. Uh, right. But he expressed that uh, uh, he's hopeful that he would be able to prevent or basically uh, call for another stage of processing before this could become effective. Okay. Let me just add that over the past 24 hours, we have numerous reports coming from Iran 
saying that people who had basically supported the hashtag or tweeted the hashtag, those who had their identities, have received messages from intelligence agencies in Iran telling them that they would be prosecuted for their action. You mean the celebrities or well-known or public people in Iran who might be on social media doing this? Exactly. And even individuals who are not celebrities, uh, people who have been tweeting with their own identities, uh, with their real names. So we should note that, I mean, depending on when people are listening to this, there's a lot that may have changed. So um, you, know, you could Google to get the latest. We're, we we want to try and step back and, and, and understand this. And, and Mohammed, I mean, uh, you know, on the face of this, it would seem like lunacy, like this. This regime has already drawn the ire of the world, if, if not for the last few decades. In the last year, the crackdown on protests last year, um, the blackout of the internet, then the shooting of Flight 752. Why would a regime which is already reeling from the COVID pandemic and severe economic hardship want to exacerbate its situation by uh, proposing to execute these three young men? Uh, well, looking at the situation from the viewpoint of the regime, it actually makes absolute sense because uh, they have uh, lost, um, for all intents and purposes, um, any measure of legitimacy over the past recent, let's say, few months. So they want to create a deterrence. They want to kill. They want to basically... Uh, execute these young people in the hope that it would create deterrence in Iranian families. You know, Iranian families are very concerned about, uh, you know, the, the well-being of their children, like any other family across the world. And many Iranian families would really try to prevent their children, their, their young ones, from going into any sort of protest in the fear that they may uh, face the same, um, you know, faith fate as as uh, as these three young men so that's the purpose they want to cre uh, create uh, a climate of fear and to uh, prevent uh, the next uprising right. not a particularly novel playbook but uh, something we've seen from this uh, regime over and over again talk to me about what you're seeing in the response from the diaspora uh, it I want to be hopeful. It feels like there's always a hashtag. There's always another pet petition, you know, uh, but this has been massive. Does this social media campaign really differ from previous ones? And if so, how? I think it does. I mean, we had a couple of other instances where hashtags uh, generated by Iranian users on Twitter um, became trending, one of them during the student uprising and um, immediately after the uh, the downing of the Ukrainian plane and during the recent unrest, the Aban unrest. Uh, but it has never been so unorganized and grassroots and uh, so universal in the, uh, in the Persian uh, cyber sphere, uh, sphere. I mean, usually we had organizations or individuals or, le you know, opposition leaders calling for a particular hashtag on social media, but this time it has been, uh, you know, beyond party political factions. It's been beyond uh, ethnic affiliations, sectarian affiliation. It has been universal. So we have people inside Iran. We have well-known Iranians, whether they are artists, whether they are in different parts of the, you know, Iranian private sector, and all across. Uh, the diaspora uh, in the Western Hemisphere. It's been like trending in the top five in the Western Hemisphere uh, in, in Twitter. If you limit that to Persian cyberspace, it's the number one trending hashtag. So this has never really happened to this magnitude before. When you talk about it being universal, um, it's so universal that apparently now it includes Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I mean, it always, mm. it always seems to complicate things when there are strange bedfellows involved in a global protest. So President Trump this week, I was surprised when I saw the tweet come out in Farsi, um, or maybe not so surprised. It's, uh, it's an opportunity, I suppose. And now as well, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who both have come out in support of uh, Edelman Akunid, uh, no to executions hashtag. 
what's your sense of where these endorsements are, what the impact they're going to have is? All of a sudden, we're faced with, okay, so if I'm in social media supporting this, I'm doing this on the side of Trump. Well, um, from what I can uh, gather from uh, tweets related or responses tweeted uh, today, uh, in response to the tweets by Donald Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu, the vast majority of them are very negative. Iranians are concerned that the regime would basically utilize uh, these tweets as a means of proving that this hashtag, this grassroots campaign, is somehow uh, connected to their uh, arch enemies, uh, the United States and Israel. And that could actually have very negative implications for, first of all, uh, uh, the three young men who are facing imminent execution. The regime could perceive this uh, as a means of justifying their execution. Uh, It could also give them a venue to attack uh, people, uh, celebrities or or. Uh, you know, significant public personalities have supported these hashtags uh, by uh, by basically associating them with the United States and especially with Israel. So I don't think it is productive. I don't think the Iranian, um, uh, you know, uh, the people who are tweeting for this campaign have welcomed this uh, in general. Um, I have seen one one particular tweet who has welcomed this from President uh, Trump, but the vast majority of responses are negative, and they're calling on on others to keep out of you know something which is purely an Iranian campaign. So I know you don't have a, a crystal ball, and um, uh, you're just one opinion. Uh, although a seasoned journalist like uh, uh, like the other folks, uh, we're going to bring up on the roundtable here. But um, if you were to guess, I mean, wh- where do you think this is going? Wh- what do you think the will happen with the regime? Will it will it be forced to withdraw these death death sentences? Do you think this is an actual turning point, or yet another blip in a in a sea of ongoing atrocities? Uh, If we look at Ayatollah Khamenei's um, uh, modus operandi um, over the past uh, 30 years, uh, uh, because of his personality traits, the fact that he's very paranoid, especially towards any sign of uh, retreat, and he's always trying to counter any bottom-up pressure from the people to the regime, uh, unfortunately, my prediction, and I hope that I'm wrong, I pray that I'm wrong, but my prediction is that they would ultimately go ahead with these executions. They are fearful that if they step back from this kind of symbolic execution of people who were uh, were involved in the recent Aban uprising, uh, this would give steam to the public uh, resentment of the regime in a sense that they would say, okay, we can push them back. They don't want to appear as if they can be pushed back. What the Islamic Republic has tried since its inception is not to repeat what they believe led to, to the removal of the Shah. The Shah stepped back many times before the revolution to give uh, you know, uh, some leeway to the critics, to the revolutionaries, but that turned into a domino effect and ultimately led uh, to his uh, to his downfall. They they really want to avoid that. Mohammed, thanks for this. I'm going to get you to stick around and and um, be part of our roundtable. Sure. Appreciate it. Mohammed Banzapour, veteran journalist and producer, member of Rook's editorial team. He's joining us today from Washington, D.C.
I should note that we plan on doing a full episode of Rook uh, to deal with the latest actions by the regime in Iran with respect to these prospective executions and the response from the Iranian diaspora with a number of different voices and experts from across the global community. But for now, our Rook Roundtable is here for a chat about what we just heard from Mohammed and also the interview this week uh, that uh, we posted on Monday with Babak Payami, the award-winning filmmaker, that drew a lot of sparks of... uh, um, uh, interest and um, conversation and attention. Uh, I should remind uh, you that we know that the Rook Roundtable is not policy analysts or experts. These are voices um, who've come together working on this program from the diaspora uh, and um, uh, their opinions are their own. So Groovy Shia is here. Hello. Uh, hi. hi. Is that you playing with your microphone? It's You're making a lot of noise with your microphone, Groovy mm-hmm. Shia. Or maybe it's that, Reza. That might have been me. Oh, hi, Captain <laughs> Reza. Hello. That's okay. Nice to see you there. Kian is here. Hi, Kian. Hi, Gian. And uh, joining our roundtable today, Bahar Almasi is a Toronto-based uh, poet and cultural activist. She's been publishing poems since the age of 14, as well as radio documentaries, podcasts, and theatrical projects. She is the co-founder of Kanun Toronto, a Persian poetry society in Toronto. Her first book of poetry, Lady Gemini, was published by Afra Publications in Canada in 2015. Since then, she has published three more poetry collections, Letter of Lead, uh, Bindless Epic and a Thousand Sounds. Bahar Al Masi uh, also has created three self illustrated children's books of poetry, which will soon be published simultaneously in Iran and in Canada. But for right now, she's in the Rook studio. Hello. Hello. Very nice to have you here. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. And Mohammed is still on the line with us from Washington, D.C. Bahar, let me start with you. Um, as our special guest. First of all, um, your reactions to what Mohammed and I were just talking about and what you see happening in the diaspora with respect to these planned executions in Iran. Well, if I'm being absolutely honest, I'm I'm happy that people are finally paying attention and all of a sudden they've uh, it's sparked interest in uh, people to do something. But uh, it's also sad because a lot more people than three people were killed. Um, a few months ago, and everybody was kept s- silent, like their silence, um, perhaps because the internet was completely out for a week. Uh, but it still pains me every time someone talks about the flight, which was devastating. It was really, really painful. But just a couple months, of, not even a couple months, a month before that, so many people were killed and everybody was quiet about it. So I'm, I'm glad that finally people are using a hashtag as a tool um, to voice their opinion, but also kind of frustrated you're frustrated because people haven't been this active before or exactly. because and you sound like you're not sure whether this is going to create change well actually i would i would be ecstatic if it creates change with their decision in execution but um there's another argument to be had about um cyber activism and whether or not that's effective I am actually a strong believer in cyber activism, even though a lot of people think it's got like a lot of people call it slacktivism yeah. almost. Um, like how much is like, like, like what you, are you doing? You post something on Facebook exactly. and figure, well, I've done my job now. That's I don't have to do anything else in terms of yeah. trying to create change. So right? the good thing about this storm, in my opinion, is that uh, this particular hashtag is saying no, do, do not execute. Yes. It's not referring to any particular name. So they by by participating in the hashtag storm, they're saying no to execution, even though a lot of these people were saying, like, I don't know if you remember the story about Ramana, whose father killed uh, her because she had a boyfriend or something. Yes. That was like a month ago or so. Yes. Um, Devastating and, story. And people, yeah. that was also, like, we have, there's no short of yes, that, yes. devastating stories, but... The, the, my point is there was a lot of people that are using the hashtag do not execute that were supporting the dad's execution. So that's interesting to me. Huh. And and I actually think this using this hashtag, even though it's referring to a very specific case, whatever the reason may be that this sparked this much passion, I'm glad that people are using it. So next time they're supporting an execution, maybe they will think twice because they have it in their 
like history that they have. Surely most of the people are, are, who are using this hashtag are not supporting executions, though, are they? I, I you do don't, not you don't know. know. Like we need Mohammed, how do you respond to what Bahar is saying? Well, I do agree with Bahar on, on one level. Uh, there has been a lot of analysis uh, on how Iranians or what price Iranians are prepared to pay uh, to bring about change in their uh, political system. And one of the criticisms which is uh, often uh, heard in you know, uh, academia is the fact that Iranians don't really want to pay uh, a hefty price for bringing about change and they would prefer uh, to be a kind of couch rebels in a sense that they would support a cause or um, you know just um, promote a hashtag and they would feel that they've done their civil um, kind of duty uh, limited to that action. Um, but at the same time, uh, I do think that uh, the, the issue here shouldn't be mixed with uh, uh, whether we're opposed to the uh, to capital punishment. Because in Iran, which is a very peculiar case, uh, people who commit the worst atrocities are uh, basically saved from the death penalty because of their because of the Sharia law. I mean, for example, in the case of uh, Romina, the father uh, or many other parents who have killed their children, many other uh, fathers who have killed or even raped their children have escaped justice because of the Sharia law, which says that your blood is owned by your father. So he can do whatever he likes with it. So I don't think we should mix this particular uh, storm with uh, w with the concept of whether we're opposed to the death penalty or not. Um, I think there are many, including myself, uh, who support the death penalty for people who commit crimes, vicious crimes against children. I think that is something which we can argue in a different, you know, setting. But um, in this particular case, we're talking about people who have protested against the regime and uh, are being executed for expressing uh, their, uh, their opinion, for taking part in protests, for chanting against the regime. That is something which shouldn't be, you know, uh, uh, shouldn't be kind of um, anything which falls under the death penalty. So in um, any case, in any country. My point is th every hashtag storm, and thank God now we have one that's actually internationally r ranking that high. I heard somewhere, I think it's the fifth uh, highest um, hashtag internationally, which is very impressive um, considering Iranian population and Iranian population that has access to the internet. So. Um, that's very impressive. But what I'm saying is there's actual intentional and non-intentional effects of the hashtag storm. Uh, and I am more optimistic about the non-intentional side of this hashtag storm because I do not look like I, I would love, as I said, I would love for the exec executions to be halted. But I am not that hopeful with the regime that we're dealing with, especially at this time especially because they did not anticipate this storm. And if anything, next time they will anticipate a storm like this and maybe they will black out the internet for longer, like whenever they make it. By the way, like any that. cynicism that you may be expressing around um, uh, social media activism or slacktivism or, or cyber, cyber activism, uh, I should know that you yourself are quite active. You're, you're not saying this as someone who's a couch potato who doesn't, who doesn't get involved in issues. You, 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 you're you you know you've you've engaged in all kinds of activism on on social media, right? Yeah. So you're not coming from a place that you think it's all uh, useless or or something. You're no, saying this I as someone who actually is in involved. It. I absolutely believe in it as a tool, especially for the masses who do not want to go out, do not want to protest, do do not want to spend their they go out of their way to do something, but they still want to express an opinion. I think. That creates a wave of change within the culture, and th that's why it's really important. And that's what I, I'm hopeful about. about. Let, me, let me bring Shia in. Shia, just uh, how how do you personally how do you feel and react when you see what's happening right now in terms of the of what seems like collective action uh, in the diaspora to try and create change around this? 
uh, it's very hard to uh, for me for me personally it's very hard to express my uh, my feelings you know it's um, we 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 are traumatized socially and uh, and you know e each year several events like this happen and we hashtag we we announce we, we announce our opinions but um, nothing happened and uh, it it getting worse actually sometimes and uh, you know p uh, I, I definitely I I posted hashtag Adam Nakonid as my I, I I think it's my social responsibility but um uh, it's hard for me to say uh, to express my feelings I think you're so crystallizing the the frustration that uh, many people feel we all feel I mean yeah. it's, uh, what what is the what, what what's you know, the answer you know, is the you know uh, it's been uh, 10 years ago that green movement happened and so <laughs> f from that moment till now I, I'm speaking uh, behalf of only myself. My hope is ru uh, w was ruined, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but I, I think we have to keep going and uh, announcing our uh, opinions. Kayla. I happen to agree with Shia, you know, it's when will this end? You have every year you have how many of these things that come up in November? We had the protests and the downing of the flight. There's a new ha it seems like there's a new hashtag every few months. And I think I agree. It's our social responsibility to spread awareness. Best case scenario, it gets some attention in the international forefront. You saw President Trump tweeting about it and which I think it's great. It's getting more attention, but like, what's the answer? What um, what's the bottom line here? I think for as long as this regime is in power, these issues are going to keep coming up. And um, when will it end? And you know, to answer Bahar, I think we we depend on um, on cyber activism because unfortunately a lot of these issues don't grab the media's attention you saw that in the protests in November nobody was covering it no, none of the news stations were covering what was going on thousands of people getting killed on the streets and it was so frustrating for me because we didn't see anybody covering this story so we we need the cyber activism to, to we need everybody to speak up because that grabs attention from the international stage so uh, yeah, Bahar, go ahead. Yeah, but what does it really do? So we get the international attention. So what has it ever, ever really done? It brings these issues to people's consciousness. So if we don't speak out about these issues, nobody will, nobody will know about any of this. So but are we waiting for a savior from outside of Iran to save us? Is that why the international attention is? I mean, like this is this is actually a turning point in my opinion. If they decide, which is highly unlikely, in, like I, I don't have a crystal ball either, mm -hmm. but in my opinion, from what I've seen so far and from <laughs> just like the pessimism that they've just put in us, it's highly unlikely that they will, like something good will come out, out of it, even despite of like all the uh, international attention. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I'm wrong, then, then your point would be true. But otherwise, what does it really do? I, I actually am going to disagree with uh, some of the cynicism myself, and which is a an unusual position for me to take. I was gutted. Uh, I'm with Shia, gutted with what happened after the Green River uh, Green, Green Movement in 2009. Uh, there was such ho there were, I mean, literally millions of people in the streets, and you go, okay, this is the moment. And if that can be crushed. What what do a, what does a hashtag army do? But I do feel like the temperature keeps rising. I feel like um, people are quicker around the world to condemn this stuff. I think the the jig is up, and I and, and 
people are angry and the anger increases. And um, with each of these moves, uh, um, the regime seems more desperate to me. Uh, I'm not someone who can pro prognosticate and say it's, it's over in six months, but it, it really, um, all of this bubbling protest that's been happening in Iran for the last year, for the last three years, for the last, uh, is significant. And, and seeing the power of the collective, you know, I mean, look, we, this program is supposed to be about the diaspora. Why is this issue so relevant to us besides the fact that we're, our ancestry is all Iran? Because the diaspora is making this an issue right now. I mean, people are screaming about this around the world, people of Iranian descent and non-Iranian descent. That is not insignificant. Let me just bring Reza in because I've, he, I haven't done that yet. You want to add anything there, sir? Uh, I'm speaking for myself over here. I'm, I'm not a political person. I don't even have a political position. I don't know anything about politics um, and what makes me like what I'm what I, the only thing that I'm thinking about I'm just like everybody else I just watch the news and get my information from the news outlets but the only thing that I'm thinking about right now is that what is the next event that is going to distract us from this terrible event that's the only thing that makes me curious R Reza you're not a political person but you did leave Iran and your family uh, at a young age, you by yourself, yep. ending up in jail in in various places. If you don't mind me, it wasn't. No, it's no. You, you, you know, you yeah. you you took a harrowing journey to get out of there because you didn't feel like you could have the life you wanted yeah. in Iran. That's true. So I mean, uh, it wasn't political, uh, and I think that was that's the that's the that that is my main that's my major issue with any anybody that bl tries to blame all of our problems on the government not that this government is is good or right or whatever it's just obviously uh they're ter terrible people but um what I'm, my issue and the reason that i left iran it wasn't that it was problem with me problem cultural issues that i think we've had we have we have this problem as Iranians, I think, and I include myself and my own m family members in it, that we always think that change got to come from outside because, oh, these people in this, this government in charge, they're ruining our country. Where, where do we think they're, they, they've come from? Mars? They're Iranians. They're, they're our friends. They're our family members. They're my uncle. They're my <laughs> uncle's friends. That's, so that's, that is what form the government of Iran. That is what form our cultural behavior. We do the very same thing to our own community and our people outside of Iran in the diaspora, and that's sad. Mohammed, how, Mohammed, how do you react when you hear Reza say something like that as someone who's been in Evin prison at the hands of this regime? Well, um, I do sympathize with Reza. I do think that many of the ailments that we are seeing in our uh, in our political system is part and parcel of our, uh, unfortunately, the dark parts of our identity. Uh, but um, where I disagree with Reza is that I think in every nation uh, you get the, uh, you know, the elites, the people who are selected by the people to reflect the best parts of their, uh, you know, collective uh, culture in the way that they're governed. In our system, because it's a, it's a theocracy and it's not a democracy, we have a, um, a, you know, a mafia which is not representative of the people who represent the worst parts of us. That's what we need to change. You know? I don't think that they represent the best of us. I think they represent the worst of us. And it's, it's up to us, up to every one of us, to try to change this equation, in my opinion. It's interesting that we're having this conversation on the heels of the of the interview with Babak Payami the other day because the issues that came up in that interview are directly related to this question of uh, are we unified in the diaspora? Should we be? How do we achieve a collective? Um, we, we, we had gone into today thinking that that's what we wanted to talk about today. Bahar, you heard that interview what, um, and you had some reactions to it. What, what were your reactions? I have a lot of reactions, actually. I agreed with his um, like blanket judgments of the culture, and that's actually uh, my fault. Like, it's not a good thing to um, 
to judge an entire culture but with blanket statements but i do agree with the fact that like we um take pride in our past or like we maybe take up talk about a lot of stuff and we're all know it all but the most important points that he was talking about i think it was artists an artist's position uh, with regards to politics and i was a little bit confused because he was talking about involvement and engagement and i don't know when we when he was talking about engagement i think he was referring to producing political art which i am totally in agreement with him uh, over because um i do not like as soon as an, a piece of work becomes that carries a direct message that has to do with politics i feel like that's propaganda but then the artist as a person has every right to participate in any kind of i um like just just any kind of activism or any kind of uh, movement that they believe so that's actually the sole the sole characteristic of an artist is to be honest with themselves but he did say and i thought um rivet rivetingly uh although i'm not sure i agree with him i, th I think i took uh, took took issue with it during the interview but he said uh real artists will never sh should never compromise which that is that politics is the art of compromise art is the art of not compromising ever and i wondered if that was possible do you as an artist believe that's possible so part of no i absolutely believe that a, an artist should not compromise so if you believe in something even though you're going to lose your followers you're going to lose your audience some people are not going to watch your film maybe or some people are not going to buy your book just because you said something no you should not compromise you should stand for what you believe in and you should act on it and that 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 goes for activism too so i did not agree with the fact that he was saying so at some point he actually said um the artist should should be involved to the point where it doesn't uh, it doesn't destroy the like create partisanship i do not agree with that because our our problem and so one point that he was making was there's a lot of partisanship and let's bring people together. Let's let's create unity. And his solution to create unity was to kind of self-censor and not say something that you believe in in order to pre like I actually wrote it down. I think. Well, he said a couple of things. He said uh, he, he said that to, to not compromise. But he also said he doesn't like to get into politics, although he's realizing that now after his rude awakening, he there's he has to get into politics. He has to speak his mind. Oh, uh, the passion was clear, I think. No, I think that the getting involved into politics, it is, it's more than anything, it's a character issue. And actually, I think he is an activist. I really don't judge, like, don't read him as someone that's not involved in politics. Like, judging from his work uh, and, and his discussions, like, this, this is a person that wants to make a difference. So, but that's that's another issue. Like, I believe any like if someone's not pol political, like Reza, and he doesn't want to get involved, there's that that's there's no issue with that because that's not his character. He can maybe be more comfortable getting involved in culture. Same so as wait myself. a second. So then, if so, then is it our social responsibility to 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 hashtag and 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 speak out when there's potential executions in Iran or not? Okay, so this is because if if, you, if you're allowed to say, well, I'm not political, I don't want to get involved, then that would suggest it's not our responsibility. It's it's only our responsibility if we feel like it, okay. which isn't really a responsibility it's, then. Yeah, definitely, it's not a responsibility. I don't think it's a responsibility. It fr frustrates the hell out of me when people were not talking about the November issue. Like my close friends know, I was going crazy. I was bawling, and there were people talking about just ice cream or like some some food photos and like it was it was devastating me pe to watch people that are that have experienced like it's the same people that are getting killed on the street uh, on the only difference is the location the geography and right. people are silent about it like that was killing me but that was their personal choice i actually had iranian friends that had no idea this was going on like i had to educate them that there was these protests and people were getting killed they had no idea because there was no media coverage of this and they had no social and media even, even so when they found out did they re really react to it no i mean like what, can, what can you do right it's good knowing it's better than not knowing what's going on in your home country I okay think. but but the thing about that was the internet was completely out so at that point it was our responsibility to right. talk about it yeah and we were the media was, we had we to educate were the people. media we were the only iranians that had access to internet and people yeah. were kept keeping silence and actually that was one of the biggest lessons i learned 
was, you know what? This is not a responsibility. As much as I like it to be, it's not a responsibility. It's a de- de- decision. It's a choice. So, um, Shia, where where do you where do you stand on that? Is it? Our, I mean, we are this. Let's just recap. We're a bunch of people who all have the same lineage or ancestry from this place where there's, we all agree there's atrocities taking place. Um, should we speak out about it? Is it our responsibility to, to speak out about it? Or should we say, look, my life is here. I'm living in North America. My responsibility is the people in my neighborhood or something like that. Um, as an artist or, or as a human? You can answer it however you, way you want. I'm sorry if it's a, I'm, I'm ambushing you with this question. I'm just, <laughs> it's a curious one that's coming up. Okay. Um, it's, uh, maybe it's a radical opinion, I don't know, but for me myself, in this period of my life, I'd rather to... Um, shut down all my connection to society in uh, f- I, i'm s- again i'm speaking about myself and make myself a better person then i can uh, i can uh, I-, I can have impact on at, uh, at first in my whole in my work house then neighbors then society then the world um at this time i think I, my responsibility is to make myself a better human being then uh, okay uh, yeah. I, I agree I agree with Shaya this this theory uh, this this goes back to the idea of who wants change everybody who wants to change nobody right and what Shaya is referring to is is it is it is an uh, analogy and a theory that I to strongly advocate for it's if you want change change yourself that's all you got to do but I don't think this necessarily applies to this particular issue of um, hashtagging and being active on social media regarding a, 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 a cause that right now three lives are at stakes. Now, um, in terms of, I think, I- whether or not this is a social responsibility of Iranians, I think it's, I don't think it is a responsibility necessarily, but it's a choice. There is a, and w- with choices, there's always a right choice, a better choice or a worse choice. So it, it, you can't force anybody to participate in 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 uh, in being part of the, um, a, a, a social media movement or whatever, or um, advocate for for for, for, for certain, certain causes. But um, you can encourage people. You can encourage people to do that. Whether or not they choose to do it, that's their personal choice. As Bahar sort of mentioned, it's, it goes back to character. Some people are not just, they're not comfortable being outspoken about anything. So before we wrap up this round table, let me just go around uh, once on the on the question as well, or, uh, or you can say anything you want as a final comment, but the question around uh, uh, unity or disunity in the Iranian diaspora, because uh, um, Babak Payami, the, uh, the fabulous filmmaker, and I uh, just, seem to disagree on that as well where i suggested in fact that with sadness that it seems like it's in our dna to not be collected not not be able to operate as a collective um and he took some umbrage at that and said no actually we 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 work well as a community together and whenever when things are at stake we usually we can we can unify we do unify we just don't like the idea of unity meaning somebody from top down uh telling us what to do so um muhammad let me start with you and then we'll go around and end off in bahar well, um, I think, um, first of all, I would like to uh, kind of um, make a statement about people who are saying that uh, being political is a choice. I actually don't think being political is a choice. I mean, whatever you do in a, in a society, uh, whatever, wherever you stand, it is a political uh, decision. You know, even if you decide to fall back into your own um, isolation, uh, that is also a political decision which has implications socially and politically. So there is no escaping from, you know, being political. Politics is the air that we breathe, that, that everyone breathes on every continent. But in terms of your question, um, I think um, there are vested interests against Iranians uh, kind of 
gathering ground uh, one um, one platform in any sense. There are many forces who are trying to divide the Iranian community into sectarianism, into uh, you know different political platforms, and I think that's something that we have to overcome if we are hoping to achieve any sort of change. Kian? To be honest, I, from the Iranian community, I don't see much unity, and I, I've seen it through my parents. My parents always want to do business with Iranians, you know, Iranian builder, Iranian architect, Iranian. And unfortunately, what I've seen a lot of times is they end up overcharging them just purely because they're Iranian <laughs> when they don't with Canadians. That's the sad truth of it. The only time that I truly see uni unity amongst the diaspora, I'm sad to say, is when tragedies like this happen with the Ukrainian flight downing, with the protests. With, that's the only time that I've seen Iranians become so unified against one cause. Or World Cup. Actually. Or World Cup, yeah, true, exactly. And uh, you know why that is? That's actually a very good point. And what, this is exactly what Babak Payami confused with unity. We as Iranians are very emotional people. Mm -hmm. Our emotions always get a better of us. So that's why in disastrous situations, when an incident like the flight, um, Ukrainian flight happens, or a World Cup, Iran wins, and now all of a sudden everybody carries the flag of Iran, doesn't matter what, 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 what logo is on it. We get very emotional and we're, we're for that cause for a little while, for just a little while, until until the momentum is gone and then we're back to what we were. But yes, in truth, we are not unified. Mm -hmm. So what Bob Payami was saying, God, during Iraq and Iran war, Iran was unified, of course, because people are emotional. People are, emo emotions are, and lives are at stakes, but more than that is what provoking people to go and put their own lives at risk to defend their families is that emotion that unites us. I don't understand. Uh, we don't have time to, like, to go too deep into it. But but so so what? It's if it's emotion that's unifying it's us. It's not. It's not logical. Oh, it's not I see. Based it's not. We're not logical. No, we're it's, it's speaking just, of it's, it's it's generalizations. <laughs> right, right. We are we are emotional people. That's right. Okay. Sorry, all right. Sorry. All right. Can I, I have to jump in. Why isn't the defense of a country uh, logical? No, it is. It is that absolute is, logic. No, that is absolute logic. But what Babak Payami, Babak Payami, the only example he had of Iranian unity was uh, the the Iraq and Iran war. Well, and that's not valid. true. He he oh. he would have given other examples. Let's oh. not. Uh, uh, but oh. but. Uh, Bam. Bam is another example. He, I think he he would he would uh, he's not here to defend himself. So, but um, I th okay. Well, let's let's. Uh, there's a lot of fodder here for people to react to. Info at rookmedia.com. By all means, let us know. I, I'm sure that there are um, folks who. Uh, might take issue with some of the things that have been said here. You're welcome to post on our social media platforms. Bahar, let me uh, end this round table with you. You are, have been our special guest here. Um, uh, final thoughts. So um, two, two thoughts. One is, um, I don't think Iranians are unique in the, the whole issue of partisanship. I think this exists in other cultures and we're just more familiar with our, our own culture. And that's what we're seeing. And also the concept of unity, I think, ha has to do, like, of course we're not going to be, like, I totally agree with Babak uh, with regards to, like, of course we're a diverse culture, uh, country with a lot of different cultures. So we're not going to be unified, even in the team we choose for uh, to support in soccer, right? What we need to unify in is learning social skills that will help us survive, like accepting that there is different differing opinions. The, so unity in values, I guess, unity in culture, that is something that we need to work on. Just being able to hear each other out, like not deleting every single person that disagrees with you hmm. on social media and every time you, have a, you raise a, a discussion, that's what we need to work on. That's where we're lacking, I think. Otherwise, no single, con like just show me a single country that will, like, will have older people unified over a sub subject. Thank you, Bahar. It's been a, a, a really nice to have you here and great. join the roundtable. And I hope uh, we can we can do it again. I know you're there's an imminent new arrival, right? <laughs> so in less than two weeks. Less than two weeks. Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to make it back in. Uh, 
maybe with child in tow, <laughs> <laughs> however you wish. Um, Bahar Almasi, a Toronto-based poet and cultural activist. Look out for her and her books of poetry. Uh, thank you to Groovy Shaya, uh, Captain Reza, to Keon. You guys will be back in a little while for Letters of the Week. And thank you to Mohammed Mazarpour in Washington, D.C. Thanks, Mohammed. Thank you. There is no border between sound and form, no border between calligraphy and music, or between text and melody. They are joined together in a marriage, and that marriage is founded upon love. Well, those are the words of Bahman Panahi describing his art as some kind of symmetry of musical notes as Farsi letters drawn using acrylic paints. Bahman Panahi is a master calligrapher, a visual artist, and an acclaimed musician who lives and works in Paris. He graduated from the Faculty of Fine Arts at Tehran University and continued his studies at École des Beaux-Arts and then Sorbonne in France toward a PhD in visual arts. He also holds a master's certificate from the Institute of Calligraphers in Iran. But here's the key. Bahman Panahi is also quite masterful in playing Iranian classical string instruments, such as the tar and setar. As such, he's blended his talents and even wrote a thesis to boot on the theme of music calligraphy, the marriage of music and calligraphy. Since 1990, Bahman has been involved with lectures, workshops, conferences, concerts, and numerous exhibitions on five continents. In addition, he has been invited as a guest professor and distinguished artist to noted institutions such as Harvard and Northeastern University. But right now, Bahman Panahi joins us from Paris, France. Hello, sir. Hello. I'm very happy to be with you. It is a great uh, great pleasure to have you on this uh, program and to discuss your art. I, I want to try and uh, start by understanding the terms of what you do. So to those who are trying to get their heads around this in very simple terms, how do you explain music calligraphy? In fact, uh, it comes to me very naturally. That's, that's very important to know, first of all. Why? Because... Sometimes we try and we just uh, do something by effort and to just uh, to be and to create something new. And it's, it's not at all my case. Uh, and I'm very happy of that because uh, from the childhood I started to learn and be in love with calligraphy and music as well because I was in a big family, a large family that my brothers, they did calligraphy, music, theater, etc. And little by little, uh, when I grow, uh, grow up and then I study in, uh, in art in Tehran and then in France, they are became as a, as a one uh, concept in my creation, in my uh, spirit, in my, my, my thinking, my looking to everything. I knew, for example, if I did calligraphy, I couldn't listen to music. In spite of it's very popular and very common. I mean, almost everybody do the painting or calligraphy. They listen to music in the same time to have some inspiration. But me, I I had this conscious that from very young age I couldn't listen to music. Even I did music myself, and it was some kind of strange for me why I I couldn't 
But so you, and, so so music calligraphy never involves listening to music. It's uh, th- this is very yeah. interesting. I mean, I'm 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 actually trying to, and I forgive me for being so pedantic about it, but I'm trying to deconstruct the the process. I mean, how you before we can even speak about how your whole story, how, how the visual and melodic characteristics of the two art forms can can come together in your painting. I I mean, do you think of a musical idea and while you're moving the brush, or does the does the brush inspire something musical in terms of the way you move it? Or how does it work? Uh, little by little, I conscious that uh, that calligraphy and music for me is the same. When I do calligraphy, it's like I'm playing or I'm singing. Uh, why? Because for for the three, for for the gesture, for for the movement, for the proportion of the of the uh, the letters and forms. This this kind of things for me was some kind of. Uh, uh, sound. It mm. was not the form. And uh, when when I started really to think about it a little bit more and to to provoke my conscience about uh, two part, uh, I saw it's like became dissolved together. And and I passed from from the music to the musicality. In that way, I I, I have to to explain that music calligraphy in in reality is is the musicality of calligraphy. It's not music and calligraphy. It's not parallel. Ah. It's the it's the sound itself. It comes from the um, from the calligraphy, because music is a is an artistic uh, expression. Uh, it is a kind of uh, genre of art. But musicality is some kind of the the quality of sound. <laughs> uh, many times the people are asking me if if this piece, for example, is. Uh, is reaction or the or uh, some reflection of some music piece? I say no at all. I, I I'm not doing that at all in this way. Right. I mean I'm not going to be affected by some some piece of music or melody or something. No, at all. Well, people me, ask that. Are, people may ask that because they're used to. I mean, there there are all kinds of artists and forms of art where people use uh, music coming out of speakers around them uh, to inspire them. I know I know a photographer, for example. Uh, exactly. She's a very well-known photographer who can't even take exactly. photos unless she's putting on a certain kind of music behind her. So it's natural that people think that way. I'm yeah, very curious. What, what So what happens to you if <laughs> when you say you need silence? In other words, the music is coming out of you. I mean, if, if I say to you, okay, Bahman, please, uh, uh, you know, you're in front of a canvas and you're going to do uh, some calligraphy and I start blasting David Bowie, uh, <laughs> what happens to your calligraphy? <laughs> I cannot. I cannot at all. You mean you can't even paint at all? No, 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 no. I cannot. I can. I mean, if, if, except, except, if I'm going to play I, I'm, the, the things I, I'm calling a performance, kind of music calligraphy performance, that's another thing. I mean, when when I do actually, maybe I, you you saw in my uh, uh, in, in internet that I do sometimes the, the performance. Sure. That I called it uh, music calligraphy. That's another thing. I mean, I selected the music. I uh, I think about. I feel about. I knew about this piece of music or this mm-hmm. person who play with me, and we are going to play together in some mm-hmm. sense. You understand mm-hmm. what I mean? So this is another things that the many people asking me. That uh, so or so because uh, we so many people they do, uh, for example, painting as you say, or calligraphy or other sculpture or something by the music, even even the live music. I mean, mm-hmm. I say no. This is this is not my case because I'm I'm going to really uh, join my my movement my uh, uh, my street my 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 uh, my gesture everything related to the music I'm listening. So it's, it's it's some kind of uh, it's I, some kind of the orchestra. I think I get it, and I it, 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 now it's really exciting me. To the, the I didn't quite understand. So it, it's would this be a correct way to say it that your painting is like an act of music itself? So exactly. if you were playing a, a folk song and I'm on the other side of the room and I start blasting Miles Davis, you you can't play your folk song while I'm playing the jazz song. Uh, you so you, the the painting itself is an act of music and that's why it cannot be interrupted by other music. That makes sense exactly. to me and that's so interesting. Exactly. That that's why I I, I say for me the the performance part of my creation is not the the music of uh, ambiance 
it means I, I'm not going to to be impression or be affected by the music and do something as a I am not passive I right. mean I, I'm not the reflection of the music I am I'm, I'm playing with I am I'm some kind of duet uh, sometimes I I explain myself and the, the musician they try to reply to me and, and otherwise so that's why absolutely I have to select the the, the music I'm going to record the playing or to 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 performers or I knew the musician or I know the music in, in, in advance to, to prepare myself and doing uh, my partition. You started calligraphy at the age of five in Iran. Now this almost yes. stretches credulity for me because this is before really learning how to write and read very proficiently. How does a five-year-old kid fall in love with calligraphy? This is the, the more important uh, philosophical question in my life. I really and very deeply I believe it was some, some kind of uh, cadeau, some kind of gift. Because when I walk in the, in the street with my mother, I saw some uh, some calligraphy in the boutiques, in the street, and something I remember, and I just uh, try to memorize. Mm -hmm. And when I come back at home, even I hadn't even, uh, enough material to, to exercise. I mean, uh, in those times it was normal that... Uh, for uh, five years uh, old children, they had no <laughs> the material for artistic creation, and I try even what with my nails to to God say to to scratch the wall, the letters and the words, wow. you know, this stuff, and it was so so uh, strange. I mean, when I think now, but for me it was the best moment in my life even, and that's why I, I knew to write and and read before before school. Uh, because of that, I mean, I try and I ask permanently from my parents, my brothers, what is it, what is that, what is this letter, why this is right, written like that, and it was not the curious of uh, education and reading or writing. It was right. the curious of the form of letters which I was crazy. Sorry, did you know when you were a kid then that this is what you wanted to do for a living? Did you even know you could make a living being this kind of an artist? Absolutely, Jean, absolutely. It was really my dream. I mean, I don't know how, but it was my dream. I never ever thought anything else that to be artist since these times. Maybe, maybe this experience also helped me a lot because I remember when the... the the art teachers bring me to this class and that class to to give them the uh, the model. Uh, I was so small, so they they had to bring a chair and uh, they put me on the chair you know, to to could write uh, the model in the blackboard. <laughs> now I I believe of that even deeper, and not in the sense of material, but I, I still I am in the same the same spirit. I mean I. I believe art and calligraphy can bring you up and up. Bahman, your work is very creative. Um, do you think your artworks can also be understood in the same way by your audience? And does that matter? I mean, does it matter to you? Be rook about this, you know. Does it matter to you <laughs> if we don't see or hear things the way you do when we're experiencing your art? No, I don't care, really. I don't care. Not not in the sense of uh, I don't care because I don't uh, care my audience, of course. This is I don't care because uh, I believe a lot in my works and I I prefer to be sincere and uh, direct with my works than to think uh, about the thinking of audience of my works. This, I think, is more essential. At least now I can say uh, very strongly that uh, I'm doing as... I want, I believe, and I love. Mm. Uh, that's it. Is there a spiritual side um, to your work, I, I, specifically the calligraphy? I've been, I've been trying to learn about this. So correct me if I'm wrong with any of this. But in the Islamic tradition, calligraphy mm. was born with the need to transmit and preserve sacred texts. So over time, and with the expansion of Islam into, into Iran. Arabic calligraphy developed in contact with Persian art and culture, and this enabled this development of this art through several styles and particular aesthetics. So, for example, it developed from the angular and square Kufic style towards more cursive and round styles, and the use of calligraphy was subsequently extended beyond the sacred text to poetry and proverbs and words of wisdom. 
Uh, would that be right? And, and if so, what texts do you use in or for your works? It, it, is there that spiritual side for you? Uh, yes, if if you let me, please, I just uh, a little bit uh, correct your... Fix my uh, history, please. <laughs> yes. <come>. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the, the correct, because uh, it's not only in Islam, it's not only in Iran. The calligraphy is uh, the art who was from the beginning in all cultures and civilization uh, related to the religious, to the spirituality, to the mysticism. Uh, in uh, Judaism, in uh, in Buddha, uh, Buddhism, in uh, Confucianism, in the Christianism, and, or in all the, the the cultures, calligraphy was uh, and is still the case that it was related to the belief, to the uh, to the philosophy, etc., etc. So, uh, but the thing has happened, uh, which is very very interesting in uh, our story in Iran, that uh, we. In uh, after 16th century, it means after uh, Safavid dynasty, we uh, turn to mostly to the spirituality, literature, and poetic uh, part uh, of the text in calligraphy, mm-hmm. which in the rest of the Islamic uh, civilization we can say is still uh, the majority is still based on the sacred and the religious uh, text. Uh, so it's uh, it's a long story about the the Safavid uh, period and the the culture in Iran after Safavid. So I think this is the, now this is not the time to say. But that's uh, you are right absolutely because I believe, as I said uh, many times, um, that calligraphy is uh, it's a little bit uh, maybe uh, heavy heavy declaration, but uh, it's true that I believe and I say that calligraphy is the only art which created by human being. Uh, I don't understand what you mean. Uh, uh, I, I mean, say, mu- okay, music let, is let created me, by human beings too, isn't it? Or dance is created no, by... No, no, I'm telling you why, why I okay. say that. Because the music, I mean, the, the principle and the, the, the structure, understanding and feeling of the, uh, of the music, sculpture, painting, etc., etc., it was already existed in the nature. Do you agree with me? Uh, you're right. This is quite deep. I, I'm not sure. I understand. What do you mean? It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, what, what what do you mean? It existed in the. So so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, t- I mean, tang, I mean tango I mean, dancing existed in nature before humans de- developed it. Of course, of course, the, the animals they do the dance. Very very <laughs> okay. interesting. The, the birds, the the snakes, the 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 animals they do the dance. The the uh, what is the uh, the but they don't uh, play. They don't play the violin. Somebody invented a violin, and they, and then <laughs> but, but, photography. But they, they photography. Which animal? I mean, I, I, I <laughs> I'm no, so no, curious I, I'm where you're going with it. The, yeah. I, I'm not. I, I'm not talking about the the the, the technique of art and okay. the, the skill of art. Okay. That's that's the skill of art. But the music itself, if you listen to uh, uh, birds. It's incredible they, they and they sing. Very you true. I mean, the Very inspiration, true. Yeah. yeah. The inspiration of the nature. I mean, I not not. I don't want to say the art was existed exactly. The the human being tried to interpret, to to understand, and they did develop in the in the sense of his uh, his own uh, skill mm. and techniques. But but the painting, the the colors, the the model, the the everything was existed in the painting. The, in the in the nature. I got you. But calligraphy started by the writing, and writing is started by the language and speaking. So it was not existed at all in the, in the nature. It's it's absolutely related to the human being itself. It's it's very related to the beauty of uh, each language, and poetry and imagination of the the word. So that's why the Persian calligraphy is really very related to the Persian language. That's that's why if in Iran, for example, there's somebody who didn't even not educated person, uh, uh, he or she has some uh, some feeling and some aesthetic uh, understanding from the calligraphy even. But here, even the, the educated person, even the artist, t- to have some uh, some some understanding from the aesthetic of calligraphy, they had some difficulty. That's so interesting to me because 
I, I, I've always believed, I, again, stick with me if this is too philosophical, we, you know, we don't have to, we can uh, go down a different path, but I've always believed that art fundamentally in its basic form is accessible. You know, it shouldn't be, it, it, there shouldn't be devout around it. It, 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 can, it can be open to anyone and to, to experience. But what you're saying suggests to me that when the art, when the calligraphy is embedded in the art or is the art, uh, it is not going to, the art's not going to be experienced in the same way or maybe as profoundly with someone who doesn't understand the language that the calligraphy is in. Is that what you're saying? Sure. And I'm not I'm I'm not sure about the the comment you said about art because do you, do you think so? For example, our understanding from the Chinese music is uh, the same feeling and so, same understanding uh, as the Chinese. Well, n- not necessarily the historical roots of it, or even the 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 comfortability with it. But I do believe that we could listen to Chinese music or anything that we've never even heard before, and perhaps I- experience emotions or um, have some kind of resonance with that. That doesn't where we don't have to be educated. Uh, we don't have to be art experts to be able to experience it. That's where I'm getting at. I, I've I've always had a problem with the the notion that you have to go to you have to have a master's degree to understand a piece of art. No, everybody should be able to look at it or hear it or or but but I I mean you could correct me if you if you disagree or you could you could push back. But but to me that's so it does raise an interesting question though when the art has uh, is is is, is dancing with a particular language. What does that uh, mean? I mean, I, funny enough, I have a, um, this is a strange thing to out, but I, I have a, a piece of art in my house that mm-hmm. is that is east far east calligraphy. I, I think it's Japanese and it's, and it's uh, vertical, you know? And it's a, I'm not sure what it says, but I like it. It looks great. So I have it sure. hanging in my house, uh, and it would be strange to me if if a Japanese person said, "Why, why do you have that in your house? You don't even know what it says. You don't understand that piece of art." I said, "Well, I like it. It looks good. It makes me happy sure. to look at it." Yeah, this is this is look. Uh, I think I think this is the the beauty surface of art. Love the beauty of art in any case, in, in any field, in any culture. Uh, it, it, it's, it's like if you go to the, for example, I don't know the, the beach of uh, Atlantic, or go to the uh, to the some some beach in other side of the world. The fresh air, fresh air is always uh, giving us the the pleasure and the refreshness. But it, it doesn't mean that this beach is the same as other beach. Right, the sense of right, con- right, con- right. contain beautifully you said. I mean? Yes, beautifully uh, said. The the things of the uh, Shemran. Uh, North of Tehran is not the same as uh, Alp. It's different. Of but Bahman, you've got a lot of fans, <laughs> and I'm guessing that they're not all Iranian. Sure, sure. No, uh, yeah, that's why, for example, as you say, uh, uh, my students, mostly my 90, 95 percent of my students are not Iranian, uh, and I had this experience. Yeah, of course, I have a lot of lot of uh, not fans, even students. They are seriously worked with me. That they are uh, not Iranian at all. I have just uh, maybe two, three Iranian students now. And the rest of uh, most most of uh, 120 person are uh, foreigners. So, having said all of that and and what I've just asked you, uh, let me come at it from the opposite angle, which is to say that this program Rook is. Uh, about and for uh, not exclusively, of course, we want anybody to listen, but uh, uh, about people of Iranian descent and the Iranian diaspora. Mm-hmm. Tell me about this connection that remains for you. This th- how this strong connection to Iran and Iranian culture that makes you in, in what you do, if you don't mind me saying this, something of an ambassador for Iranian culture. Why that's why that remains for you and is so important to you. Mm, ambassador. I don't feel myself as ambassador, but I will always uh, try to be sincere and be friend with my artistic life, which is my life actually. So uh, if it's happened something like that, uh, I'm sure it's something just just natural, just happened. Because I love uh, our culture, I love uh, Iranian uh, 
uh, cultural heritage. Uh, I got it. I, I love that. Also, I don't know if you know this, but calligraphy is the only art that was created by humans. <laughs> <laughs> It is such a pleasure to talk to you. I'm a fan of your work. Uh, we've all been looking at it on the the Rook team, and we're all enamored of what you do. And uh, I'm very grateful for the time that you took to do this interview. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Jan. I'm also. Uh, it, it was a great pleasure, and uh, I really congratulate you for for all you are doing for uh, for your program for culture, art, and artist. Merci. Good courage. Good courage. Bye bye. Bahman Panahi, a master calligrapher, a visual artist, and an acclaimed musician who lives and works in Paris. He joined us from Paris, France today. Back here on this episode 27, Keon. Episode 27. 27. Man, it goes by quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and well, we're taking it, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, and the the gang has reassembled. Sans uh, our guest today, Bahar, who was part of our Rook Roundtable. Uh, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, Keon is here. Keon, you may know her, uh, the star of Letters with Keon. <laughs> <laughs> Is that sarcasm? So, <laughs> I uh, I make fun of myself, not you. When as I say do that. I. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things. Letters to do. of the week. L as as the kids know it, L O T W. That's the way it trends Get whenever ready, we do kids. the same. <laughs> yeah. Gather round, children, it's time. Club. So last week on episode 25, 25. 25. Can you believe it. Quarter Keon. of yes. a century. Keon Docht. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> clarifying what my full name is. Yeah. Anyway, we had uh, we had an interview with Iranian Canadian visual artist Ebrin Bogheri. The rising star joined us to discuss self portraits, ideas of masculinity, breaking taboos, as well as his surprising take on censorship in art. Um, so it was a tad bit controversial his opinion on that. Anyway, so we had a few people that wrote in. We have a Ali Khalili on YouTube. He mm. wrote. That was a nice, somehow controversial interview. I would have expected Gian to dig more into Ebrin's past experiences when he was living in Iran rather than his post-Iran experience. Mm. What do you have I, to say? I, I, well, this is what I have to say. I would have expected Gian to do that too. <laughs> but Ebrin made it quite clear mm. a couple of times in the interview that he didn't really want to go there. I mean, there's only so many times I can ask before it's badgering. Mm. Uh, so I, I asked a few times about, you know, and he said, I prefer some things to just be a yeah. mystery. And you could tell. So, he was, and I, which, of course, whets one's appetite. Well, what what is he not telling us about his mm. uh, upbringing in Iran? But um, that's his choice. But I, I get I get the, uh, the letter writer's uh, point. And we do appreciate criticism, so keep it coming. Well, Thing. Well, <laughs> it can't we all be positive. Not, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you saying horrible things about us. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what's his name? Uh, uh, it was Ali, Ali Khalili. Ali, Kha Ali Khalili. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, it Good wasn't point. necessarily sure. negative. Yeah, yeah. He was just yeah. Uh, Hanny Aryan on YouTube wrote, "Loving the new intro, nicely done." That's true. We have that little. You know what yeah. that? Have you, Keon, have you seen it? I have, of course, I have. Yeah, and hold you on, know who? On, you know who worked on that? I have no idea. Yeah, who exactly, was that? <laughs> exactly, because you only see him as a pretty face. I'm wondering yet, who this pretty face <laughs> is. <laughs> My mind is scattering. Captain Reza. <laughs> oh, oh, Captain I, I Reza and Ponta. <laughs> I guess yeah. he is a pretty. <laughs> That's nice. Good you job, Reza. Now Good job, Captain. Said, There's guess. a reason why you're a captain. <laughs> so for those of you, exactly, this is how he became captain by oh. doing this. So if you uh, if you watch, if you, if, uh, I mean, for those who listen to us on SoundCloud or Spotify or something, uh, the YouTube version of our program has some visuals, including a new visual intro. Intro. Although yeah. it's really just half of it because he hasn't finished the second half. That's correct. I've been bugging him up to, to the, Maybe you know. you'll be promoted to Admiral. Right. Above captain. Soon he shouldn't enough. even be captain at this point for, <laughs> yeah, for only doing half of the intro. But, you know. 
club and then we have so, yeah so we, thank you to the person who noticed that to yeah. the one person who noticed the hard work that, no, that a few intro. people noticed yeah, yeah. Right. um we have shaggy shaggy on youtube um username shaggy uh, said, I enjoyed this interview, especially because I'm a big fan of Ibrin's work. Mm. The yeah, questions nice. that Gian asks his guests during each interview are so fantastic. It draws you into the world slash mind of that artist. He's such a talent. I also wanted to point out, as you guys covered in the interview yourselves, I don't think Ibrin is a fan of censorship. He meant limitations uh, can add to your creativity. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Sherry. Good points. Yeah. Uh, we have a username, my Nikon on YouTube wrote, love the new intro video again. Oh, yeah. oh there we go. It's been noticed. And the intro tune is growing on me with a thumbs oh, up. Nice. I'm starting to hear those piano keys in my head. Oh, yes. Oh, that's nice. Fantastic. How do you feel, Reza? You feel pretty good about yourself. Yeah, well, the piano keys are. Reza has nothing to do with that music. Ah, well, but, the uh, intro. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, feel, it feels good. It That's feels good. good. I'm Captain glad you Reza. feel good. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have uh, Mojgan Big Delo said on Facebook, it's a pleasure to get to know more talented, hardworking Iranians. Thank mm. you. Yes. Yeah. Nice. It's true. I agree. Well, that's, 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 that's what we should that's, hope. That's what we do over here. Okay. That is what we Settle do. Settle down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Anush Iptakar on Facebook wrote, I just discovered your new show today and already listened to six episodes Ooh. in a row. <laughs> nice. Wow. Yes. That's, that's great. Binge, yeah. A binge listener. Yeah. Yeah. Binge great. He, can I finish? Yes. yes. <laughs> great podcast. You're helping us be more proud of being Persian. Great inspirations. Thank you from Vancouver. Nice. Thank, Thank you, you, Anush. Anush. Yeah. And then we have Al Rostami. Yes, Al Rostami on Instagram wrote, it's nice to see who's there at the studio. Lovely interview. And that's because we had the video, a little uh, clip I mean, of the we video. Gonna, are we going to out this? I don't know. People, I don't know. Some people noticed that and they wrote to us. Yeah. So wanna, the, really, the really keen mm. uh, Rook fans who are, are experiencing Rook on YouTube and watching the screen. You guys, a lot of things you gotta do to, to catch this. If you continue watching the screen through that entire Ebrine episode, at one point, we lift the curtain a little bit on the, uh, with a bit of video. And we won't We're not going to video just yet, but uh, yeah, you might see. It's a nice see, little surprise. You might see something. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's nice. And we won't say where it is throughout the interview. No. No, you gotta find out for yourself. Secret location. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, next. All right. So, uh, in previous episodes, I can't, I don't, I can't even, I don't know how many episodes we've discussed this, but uh, we had a bit of hat controversy that was brought up by Shia um, a few times. Who knew that it would become such a thing? So, two different uh, individuals wrote on previous um, uh, episodes. We have Huge Spliff wrote, Colos Chapeau was said before the revolution. Pahlavi hat is different. You guys need a teammate with more information. Mm. Oh, I'm mm. sorry. Oh, oh no. Sure. <laughs> well, it's true that we need a teammate with more information. It's a, <laughs> it's a general a general rule of the show, but they, okay. All right, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that actually yeah. makes sense. And another individual uh, user named Speech Plan said, no, it's not hat cap in Farsi. All of you don't speak Farsi. It's kolae baseball. So we can all laugh together about your Farsi proficiency. It's Kolai baseball. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Kola cap. I've never heard that. Kolai baseball. Base. Uh, I listen. Kulai. Everybody well, has you their have, own yeah. plays opinions. Nobody baseball in Iran. By the way, Keon, we've got this new studio position. You you need to face towards your mic. <laughs> you keep, I like you to keep turn wanting, around. Like, and you want to look at Shia like and Reza, <laughs> but then you don't. You can't. You're not talking in the mic. I like to see them when they're speaking. Yeah. All right. Expression. Well, we'd have to. <laughs> Move, yeah. move you again. <laughs> a movable mic. Can I? What if I put? Can we have little dolls of them in front of Honestly, you? Honestly, I'm like a child. Pictures I, of them, photos. I, I legitimately have oh ADD. I can't just focus on one spot. Okay. Wow, we've already reached the letter of the week. Letter of the week. Woo! So Daver Bonab on YouTube says, "I strongly believe that we, as a whole, the Iranians, suffer profoundly from lack of communal, not individual, self-esteem and confidence, which is caused by a severe identity crisis due to what has been happening in our country for the last four decades of change. 
our national identity has been knowingly and adamantly trampled on, while an invented version of a known religious identity has been unjustly pushed upon us. This created a rather peculiar identity crisis as we did not subscribe to the new idea, whereas the bombardment of the same religious ideas propaganda over so many years and with all the forces and leverage available to the propagators truly tainted the identity that has kept us together for centuries. All I am saying here is merely from my personal observation and my deep love and care for my country and heritage. I'm not claiming to be an expert analyst on what is happening to us by any means. But in my opinion, the very first step to infuse hope in our community for any improvement is to revive the simple and humble respect to being Iranian. If we do not respect what we are, we cannot even start treating our illness of identity crisis. Respecting being Iranian does not mean advocating for, uh, for the idea of superiority. It simply means we are just like others, no worse for sure. Let's start by saying hello to each other on the street simply because we are Iranians. Beautifully said. That was really, yeah. Yeah, that's a, I, there's I a lot that. in that letter. Yeah, that's it's very a lot to unpack. Hello, by the way. <laughs> and it's true. I, I noticed it a lot. When you go to a lot of Persian events, you see both men and women, they kind of look at each other in a judgmental fashion. And um, it's just not a friendly vibe in my experience. Um, that's the way I feel yeah. when you look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Lack of respect. So yeah. I, when I enter you into a... You judge everybody from the moment you... You, you have no not. respect for anybody I'm on this team. I'm so <laughs> respectful. It's and it's because we're Iranians. It's how this I show... Was if I make fun of you, that's sh me showing respect to you, Reza. You see, this was directed to you, Kian. It must have yes, been. I know it's always about me, isn't it? <laughs> but well said. But it's, it's true. Like when I go into a Persian event, I try to be extra nice because yeah. I'm always careful. I don't want to, you know... I don't know. How do you guys? What's your experience with this? You care careful because you don't want to what? I don't I, like because everybody's just looking at each other in a fearful way and kind of everybody's just waiting to. I don't know. It's tense. It's a very tense. I don't know if Darvey was talking about Persian events necessarily. Well, that was, I'm just but, uh, but my you know if you happen to see someone on the street who's Persian, just say hi. Mm -hmm. Say you say hi. But that's his he's point. saying he's saying he right. Yeah. He's saying. Uh, um, you know, reach out uh, and uh, and express solidarity with mm -hmm. your your, with your Iranian people. brothers and sisters. Yeah. You know what? I had a great experience actually not too long ago on the subway. Mm -hmm. I was That's standing great. there um, and looking at my phone, uh, and this Persian lady walked over to me and she said, uh, "Do you need any help?" In English? Uh, no, in Farsi. Okay. She, oh, she asked me. She was like, "Are you like Persian?" I'm like, "Yes." She's like, do you need any help? I'm like, oh. uh, no, I'm good, thank you. Komak lazimdari. Yeah, komak. She thought like I was perhaps like a newcomer or mm. I was looking for something. <laughs> she was like, Aww. she thought I was, yeah, she th I may have been, I may have had the confused look on right, my face. Right. So <laughs> As you stare <laughs> into nice. nothingness. That's, That's right. Really you, nice. know, you know, the, the yeah. people wonder, yeah. is he, um, <laughs> is he okay? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you need any help? <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Yeah. Do you so. think that, and you think that she was doing that because she thinks you're Iranian? No, she asked me. She was like, are you Iranian? I'm like, uh, yeah. She's like, so uh, Komak Mikhan, do you need any help? I'm that, like, that, no, I'm, I'm good, thank you. That was very nice, but why <laughs> did she think that maybe in the subway you need, what, 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 what <laughs> no, were I don't you know. doing? What were you doing? <laughs> maybe like uh, she thought pr probably like I'm looking for direction. I don't know where I'm going. What, what is it? What, what were you doing? Why would someone <laughs> come up to you and, uh, and say, do, <laughs> do you need help? All right. I was able-bodied. <laughs> Young okay. man, I, I, I had I'm a long new, day I'm at new, work. I'm newcomer <laughs> here, but nobody <laughs> never came. <Aww. laughs> Were you looking at a map? Were you perhaps you know crying? <laughs> I had a great experience. Were you dressed in a... You guys ruined it. That that All right. Thank no. you very much, everybody. Uh, Kian Docht, Captain Reza, <laughs> the Groovy Shia. We want to go out on some music. Let me tell you what it is. From 1977. Uh, I mentioned Divar, Walls, uh, with uh, Mahmoud Panahi. This is, of course, the song Divar by Farmaz Aslani the Great. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who works so hard on this show. Our little team, Shia, Panta, Reza, Susan, Mertad, Mohammed, and Kian. And uh, thank you to all of you out there who are listening and subscribing. Very much appreciated. Mizun Bashin. Ye divare, ye divare, ye divare 
یه دیواره که پشتش هیچی نداره تو که دیوارو پوشیدن سیه هبرون نمیاد دیگه خورشید از توشون بیرون یه پرندس یه پرندس یه پرندس یه پرندس که از پرواز خود هست از بونه بالشو بستن دست دیروزا نمیاد دیگه حتی به یادش فردا یه روز یه خونه ای بود که تابستونا روی پشت بونش ولو می شد خرشید درخت انجیر پیری که تو باغ بود همه یه کودکی های مرا می دید یا وازه یا وازه یا وازه یه آوازه که تو سینم شده هم باری عشقیه که میچکه روی گیتار به این آقبت کی گیرد این کار یه مردابه یه مردابه یه مردابه یه مردابه توی تن از فراموشی یه چراغی که میره رو به خاموشی نگردد شله ور بیهوده میکوشی یه روز یه خونه ای بود که تا بستونم روی پشت بونش ولا می شد خرشی درخت انجیر پیری که تو باب همه یه کودکی های مرا میدید یه دیواره یه دیواره یه دیواره یه دیواره که پشتش هیچی نداره تو که دیوارو پوشیدن سیه هبرون نمیاد دیگه خورشید از توشون بیرون یه پرندس یه پرندس یه پرندس یه پرندس که از پرواز خود هست از بونه بالشو بستن دست دیروزا نمیاد دیگه حتی به یادش فردا